this past week I picked up a book that the title really intrigued me. Uh, It's called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. I don't know if you've ever read this book. It came out back in 2000, and uh, I missed it, but it's a pretty provocative book and is known as a pretty significant book talking about things in America. But this book is not about the sport of bowling, but about the fact that more and more people in America are choosing to do more and more things alone. Now, if you think about it, bowling has always been the ultimate group activity, right? Um, Some folks bowl for competition or they they bowl in a league. Uh, Others do it just for companionship. But either way, when you're bowling, you're doing it with other people. Well, Putnam suggests that we are losing our sense of community in America. And the proof of that fact is that the type of things that more and more people are doing alone. And bowling's just a metaphor for a whole range of activities. I mean, think about people go to the movies alone. They go to restaurants, concerts, athletic events. They go on vacation alone. And Now, that can be explained for a lot of reasons, Uh, some of them that more and more people are choosing to live single, and uh, so companionship isn't as readily available. And alone activity is really, really important for all of us. Every one of us needs some time alone. It's very necessary. However, says Putnam, that a significant issue facing our society is that lots of folks struggle with how to initiate and maintain significant relationships in their lives. And as a result of that, more people are bowling alone. Now, George Barner recently did a study that said 75% of the American population, adult American population, says that having close personal friends is a top priority in their lives. 75%. But a study done by Duke University discovered that the number of people in America who do have a close personal friend... Uh, Back in 1985, 10% of the people said they did not have a friend. In 2004, 25% of Americans said they did not have a friend. And by 2010, 35% of America said they do not have a friend. Lots of reasons for that. We get really busy and focused on all kinds of things. But every single one of us has a deep hunger for genuine, authentic relationships with other human beings. Doesn't that have something to do with the fact that we watch reruns of Cheers and Friends and Seinfeld? How many times a day can you watch one of those shows? NCIS. I'm sorry, we watch it 10 times a day in my house. And isn't that really about friends? About a relationship. Now, it's also interesting to note that the number one reason people join a church is a desire for friendship. They're not looking for a friendly church. They are looking for a friendship. It's a difference. They don't join because of good preaching or inspirational music or great programs or outstanding mission. And all of those things are really, really important. But the number one reason across all denominational lines is that people are looking for genuine, authentic relationships. And I think that makes sense. Because in the very beginning, God created you and me to be in community. Remember, God created Adam and then said, it's not good that man should be alone. Okay, this wasn't just about finding a wife. This was about finding a relationship with another human being. We were created, we are hardwired for community. And if you read throughout the entire biblical narrative, you hear story after story of significant relationships between people. And think about Jesus. He invited 12 folks to join him in a very intentional community. They ate together. They learned together. They washed each other's feet. They prayed together. They did ministry together. Now, they weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Remember, they fought with each other. They competed with one another. They were real people like you and me. They were a real, genuine, honest community, one that was highly intentional, one that was face-to-face, life-on-life, together. Now, not only did Jesus model community, he taught about community and building healthy relationships, and that's reflected throughout the entire scriptural narrative 
And in fact, if you look, the underlying assumption is that if you are in Christ, you are to be in community with one another. It's so essential that throughout the New Testament, uh, the New Testament writers pair the word one with another 67 times. We're told to love one another and encourage one another and care for one another and serve one another and bear one another's burdens and respect one another and not neglect to meet with one another. And there's another 60, and I won't go through all those 60. (laughs) Well, today, Bill read to us about the first Christian community. And I believe it really gives us insight into how you and I are called to be the church today. And it all has to do with authentic, genuine relationships. Now, if you remember, the very first church began with 120 people. And you know, those 120 people were from all walks of life all walks of life. They were Republicans and Democrats and Libertarians. They were blue-collar workers and white-collar workers and day laborers and PhDs. They were people from throughout the entire Mediterranean area. And that group very quickly grew from 120 to 3,000. Okay, think of all of a sudden we had 3,000 people come into this community. It'd be pretty tough. But remember, only 120 of those people had known Jesus for very long. Those 3,000 people had never even heard of him until the Holy Spirit came and brought them in. So talk about struggles with assimilation. They were coming from different places with different histories and different backgrounds, and yet they experienced something amazing. They experienced community. How? How'd that happen? Well, yes, the Holy Spirit came, but it wasn't just that. They did something. They did something in response to the Holy Spirit coming into their lives. When Bill read the scripture today, there's one word that jumped out at me. It's jumped out at me every time I've looked at the scripture this week, but it's the word devoted. They devoted themselves to some very specific things. Now, what does it mean to be devoted to something? The Greek word that's used here describes people who are faithful and dedicated, unswerving in their commitment to something or something, someone or something. And it has to do with enduring and sticking with something, even when it'd be easier not to do so. But what were these early Christians devoted to? Well, Luke writes they were devoted to teaching and fellowship to breaking bread and prayer. Now, I hope you noticed that fellowship was one of four activities that they were devoted to. Fellowship in the body of Christ is not a side issue. It is core to who we are as Christians. Now, the word fellowship that we translate as fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, which literally means a close association involving mutual friends and sharing. Uh, It's a word which is used to describe a partnership uh, where two or more people are committed to being part of one another. They're connected. They belong together. So when Acts 2 talks about the Christians devoting themselves to fellowship, it doesn't mean that they all shook hands and ate donuts and coffee after Pentecost worship that Sunday. What happened that day was just the beginning, the beginning of a deep, intentional involvement with one another, with mutual relationships. They didn't just share coffee together. They shared life, real, honest life. They devoted themselves to relationships. Now, you and I devote ourselves to all kinds of things. Some of you know that on Easter, I made a commitment to devote myself to doing some things so I'd be physically healthier. And my first step was that I started eating healthy, which was a real stretch for me. Um, And we've all heard it said that if you do something for 21 days, it becomes a habit. And so once I started eating healthy, uh, for the most part, I had no desire for unhealthy food. In fact, if you asked me to drive through Whataburger today, I would probably, uh, I literally get sick to my stomach. I have no desire for fast food and french fries. You know, I used to live on that. Um, And the thing I crave is water. 
My kids have told me for years if I just start drinking water, I wouldn't want anything else, but I was addicted to sweet, bushes sweet tea, water. Well, after eating healthy for about four weeks and lost some weight, I thought, you know, probably, I, you know, I wasn't losing as much as I wanted to lose. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe if I exercised, huh, interesting thing. Uh, and then, but when? I'm not a morning person, and my day flies through the day from the moment I uh, get out of bed. So God started waking me up about five in the morning, and if you know me, you know that is God, that is not Nancy. So I'm awake at five in the morning, thought, okay. So I went out and got on a recumbent bike that we have, and I rode for about five minutes, and it about killed me. I thought, I'm going to die. I could not catch my breath. It was horrible. Five minutes. Well, each day I've increased that, and I want you to know that this morning, I rode the recumbent bike for 35 minutes and the elliptical for 35 minutes. And I, yes! <laughs> And I have not missed a day since I started, and my body craves the exercise. When I wake up, my body is saying, exercise, exercise. It wants to do it. Now, there have been some days. Last week, I had a couple days. I had a really busy, busy week, um, and I didn't really want to exercise. But I remembered my commitment. I remembered I devoted myself to getting healthy. And you know, folks, we can devote ourselves to getting healthy unless we do something, we're not going to get healthy. I can talk all I want about losing weight until I start eating healthy, I'm not going to lose weight. I can talk all I want about lowering my blood pressure and all the different things my doctor says I need to do, but until I exercise, it's not going to happen. So I've made myself get out of bed, and I tell you, after about five minutes, I'm liking it. Now, this is a miracle. I want you to know I'm 57 years old. I've never liked to exercise. I've never liked to get out of bed before, really before 9 o'clock, but before 7.30 in the morning. And I love chips and salsa. I mean, I love chips and salsa, but I don't want them anymore because I devoted myself to something. And just so you'll know, I've lost 17 pounds. Woohoo! <laughs> But the most important thing is that I have more energy. Now, you may not have noticed it, but the people who live in my house notice that I have an incredible amount of energy. I feel good. Oh. <laughs> the same can be said for our commitment to community. People tell me all the time that they're lonely and that they want true friends. But unless we devote ourselves to that happening, unless we take a step to make that happen, nothing's going to change. We're going to keep being lonely. We're going to keep being by ourselves and thinking we don't have any friends. Well, today we start this 30-day challenge, and that challenge has to do with us becoming healthy spiritually. And we're not becoming healthy spiritually so we can check off something on the list. We're doing it so that we will feel good, so that we will experience more love and more power in our life. My devotion to exercise has caused me to feel good. Our devotion to the spiritual disciplines in the church, first being community, will enable us to feel more spiritual and feel more connected to God and one another. Now, you, you have a brochure in your bulletin. There's all kinds of things listed in there that'll give you all kinds of opportunities to get to know other people. Everything from uh, lunch out on Sundays to backyard barbecues and baseball games and worships, worships, worship and small groups and mission activities. But you are the only one who can actually get to those places. You are the only one who can commit to doing so. You know, experiencing true community does take commitment. And it takes a willingness to risk. Charles Swindoll says, uh, actually compares the American church to two porcupines trying to keep warm on a cool night. He says, we need to draw close. We know we want to draw close. But we are afraid to do so because we are afraid of being hurt in the process. But think about porcupines for a minute. Now, they have 30,000 quills on their little body. But they have two methods of interaction. They either run or they attack. So like when another animal comes up to them, they make a choice. They either push out their quills and attack that one, or they go running as fast as they can away. Now, obviously, they don't have a lot of friends. And if you think about it, you know, of other animals, you know, wolves run in packs, and there are herds of elephants and gaggles of geese and swarms of bees, but there's no name for a group of porcupines because they go it alone, except in late autumn, 
we had a young porcupine thoughts turn to love, which can be a really risky business physically, okay? <laughs> so how do you get close without being hurt? Isn't that our dilemma as well? How do we get close to one another? Because instead of barbs and quills, we tend to get hurt. And we get hurt through rejection or insecurity or resentment or envy. We get hurt through what we think people are doing or saying to us, which they probably aren't. So yeah, in the course of doing community, we might get hurt. We might hurt somebody else. And as much as we understand our need for community, and no matter how intense our desire is, after we've been pricked a couple of times, sometimes we say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to be in a small group. I'm not going out to lunch with the group. Last time I went out to lunch, I sat at a table by myself. I'm never going to lunch again. Or last time I went to the ball game, there wasn't anybody to talk to, or whatever it is. But you know... There are a whole lot of porcupines in North America. In fact, some parts of the country, there are a lot of porcupines, which does prove something. (laughs) They've decided that that little bit of pain is worth the risk, is worth having babies. Somehow they've learned that they welcome one another as is, quills and all. Okay, that's the theology of the porcupine. I know you really needed that, but... (laughs) You know, we have to just accept one another as we are. And every one of us has lots of yucky stuff. And every one of us does stupid things. But we just need to love one another, you know? And when somebody does something that hurts us, we don't need to think that they're just attacking us because we're a horrible person. It's their pain. They're just hurting. We just need to love them. We just need to love them. You see, true community isn't made up of normal people. In fact, I don't even know if there are any normal people. I hear people say all the time, oh, my family's dysfunctional. I said, I don't know anybody that's not dysfunctional, okay? We all are wounded. True community isn't made up of people who are always nice and always have a smile on their face and always say wonderful things to us. True community is where imperfect people like you and me pursue life with other imperfect people. And it's where we accept one another with all our prickly barbs and all. We need community. We need it personally. We need it spiritually. We need it communally. And the only way for us to experience it is to commit to getting to know others. I challenge you to think about joining a small group or to think about doing some of these activities that have been listed You know, sometimes you think something in very spiritual, but I'm telling you, there's been more community formed over doing construction on this house than I've seen in a long time. I've seen people out there working together. And it's not just people who know how to build. Yesterday, there was a bunch of folks up here picking up trash off the ground, and that was really important to have happen. There are lots of things that happen. And together, when you're working together, you get to know one another. So don't do it for me. Don't do it to show somebody else that you've take this, taken this challenge, you're going to commit to doing this. Do it for yourself because you will be blessed. You will find that you feel the power of God's love in your life through other people. Let's stop bowling alone when we come to church. Let's celebrate being the body of Christ. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we know you've created us to live in community and, and we really want that. But sometimes it's hard for us to decide to do that. Maybe we've been hurt. Maybe we escape by just being so busy there in time. So God, I ask that you just give us a desire. Give us a desire for being in relationship with other people. And then somehow increase our devotion to making that happen. May we experience your love and your power in exciting new ways as we cultivate authentic community here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.